good evening everyone and uh, welcome to our meeting tonight. My name is Gavin Merrifield and I'll be your chair for this evening. Uh, this is our first meeting of 2021 so happy new year to you all and I hope that you were able to have a good Christmas as well in uh, whatever form and where you were able to. Uh, here in my house we had a very excited seven month year old who was very much into all of our wrapping paper um, rather than her presence herself but I'm sure that will change in future years. We may still be in try, try, some trying and difficult times, but here at CIS Manchester, we have an exciting programme of talks lined up over the next few months. These talks will touch on how science and Christianity interact with one another, but also include some perspectives from art and church history, as well as more familiar areas such as the environment and the quantum world. You can register for any of these talks already over on our Eventbrite page or find out more about them over on the Christians in Science website at www.cis.org.uk. You can also view our past events from the last term as well as many other relevant talks from CIS over on our YouTube channel as well. Uh, if you'd like to know more about CIS or support us by becoming a member or friend of CIS, then also check out our website. Uh, so tonight uh, we are welcoming here uh, Professor Andrew Hellstrap, who will be speaking to us shortly under the title Science as a Christian Vocation, where he will bring some insights to us on how the Christian who is a scientist might regard their work in the wider scheme of Christian life and faith. Andrew is Emeritus Professor of Biochemistry at the University of Bristol, and he has had a long prize winning career in both research and teaching but he has also participated more widely in the activity of scientific funders and the community and with the work of the church, including being the chair of Christians in Science itself between 2013 and 2019. I won't say much more, as I'm sure he will be telling us more about all of this himself. Andrew, uh, we welcome you tonight and eagerly look forward to what you have to bring to us. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to talk about this. I'm sure that uh, for some of you, this will not be terribly new, um, but I think for others, just hearing another Christian who's a scientist talking a bit about how they see their work in the context of being a Christian uh, can be helpful. What I want to do this evening is to begin by giving you a personal story. I don't think you can talk about science as a Christian vocation without being personal. So I'm going to talk a little bit about my early Christian uh, upbringing, as it were, and my scientific foundations. Um, and then I'm going to say something about the guiding principles that I ha have uh, underpinned my career as a scientist and, uh, and a Christian. Then I'm going to give you some proper science. I'm going to talk a little bit about the science I've been involved with. Um, then I want to, in the sort of last third of the talk, I want to say something about what the challenges are of being a Christian in science and what special opportunities that it may bring to serve God. So that's where we're going. And I want to start with this picture. It was actually a painting of the house that I was brought up with, uh, brought up in, in Tiverton. I was very fortunate to have this wonderful uh, home as a child. I had Christian parents. Um, who got me reading the Bible using Scripture Union notes from the age of five. I think they were honeycomb notes. So I, I, I had a sort of solid uh, Christian foundation right from the beginning. I also was always, as far as I can remember, inquisitive about how things work. And particularly, I got interested in um, chemistry. And I had a very nice chemistry set. Um, in fact, it was a rather better chemistry set than many people because my father was a dentist and he was able to get all the chemicals that I wanted from the local pharmacist. Um, we also had a cellar in the house which made a very nice underground laboratory in which I performed some quite hair-raising experiments. I made my own fireworks, but I think my coup de grace was when I decided about the age of 11 uh, to investigate electrolysis. I'd read that 12 volts DC um, would produce hydrogen and oxygen from water, so I thought I'd give it a try. I got a light bulb to make the two filaments, and I thought, well, why bother about 12 volts? I'll connect it up to the mains electricity, and uh, switched on, and I blew the whole house fuses. 
stopped my father from working and was not very popular. Um, I learned a lesson. But I did enjoy science from a very early age. I was also very lucky um, to go to um, an excellent school for my, uh, what was those days, O-levels and A-levels, called Blundells, and had some really superb science teachers there, one of whom I still keep in touch with. He became a professor of botany uh, in Vancouver University. He was a Christian and uh, he was also a biochemist. So he was the one who really got me excited about biochemistry. So it was a very privileged uh, education. And that continued when I was uh, able to go to Cambridge University. I went to Sydney Sussex College. Um, and there I studied natural sciences and specialized in, as you might expect, biochemistry. Um, I was very influenced there by the Christian Union. Um, the, the Christian Union there was just amazing with the biblical teaching that I got, the friends that I made, many of whom I've kept up with, and it was really provided a solid foundation. I think, I think my Christian faith became fairly personal at about the age of 11 when my father sent me with uh, some friends to a boys' Christian camp, and I, I think I, my, my faith became personal then, and interestingly, um, so it did of the people I took, and three of them ended up ordained. So that was amazing. Um, but it was really at Cambridge, I think, that I, I built very solid Christian foundations in terms of my Christian doctrine and understanding of my faith. One of the things I learned very early on was that all truth is God's truth. And it was only later that I realized that Augustine of Hippo in the fourth century had said something very similar. Let every good and true Christian understand that wherever truth may be found, it belongs to his master. So I, I realized that whether the truth came through scientific investor, investigation or scripture, it was God's truth. And that also was something that I uh, found very helpful with this quote from Francis Bacon. God has laid before us two books or volumes to study if we will be free from error. First, the scriptures revealing the will of God, and then the creatures expressing his power. And that, I think, is very much what I thought, that I could learn about God's activity in the world through science. And in a sense, the, the theology, the understanding of the spiritual realm through scripture. And I guess that reflects really the what, what was often thought of as the scientist psalm, Psalm 19, which is a psalm in two halves. The first half talks about the book of God's works, God at work in his creation. And the second part, the book of God's words, as we find them now in scripture. And verses one to six, of course, are the, the book of God's works. And verse one, the heavens declare the glory of the Lord and the skies proclaim the works of his hands. That's very much what the scientist is seeing as he or she investigates the world we live in or the universe we live in. And then, of course, the second half of that psalm, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. And so I learned very early on to think of scripture and science as two ways of understanding God's truth that were totally compatible. Um, and I, I guess that I, I very much appreciated uh, the, the works of the early experimental scientists, people like Galileo, Kepler and Newton, who very much saw their scientific work as understanding how God works in his world. And in a sense, as this verse from Psalm 111 says, as they pondered them, they took delight in God. Great are the works of the Lord. They are pondered by all who delight in him. And that verse, I think, is very important because as we as scientists study the world that God has made or the universe that God has made, we take delight in him. It, it, it's a form of worship. 
And I'm sure you know that um, the uh, Cavendish Laboratories in Cambridge was set up uh, by James Clark Maxwell, a very keen Christian. Um, and those laboratories, of course, I, I believe now it's up to 29 Nobel Prizes that have been uh, awarded to people who studied um, at the Cavendish Laboratories. But when he set them up, as you may know, he insisted on having over the door um, of the laboratories that the words from that psalm, uh, written in Latin, but nevertheless, the words of Psalm 111, verse 2, grace are the works of the Lord, they are pondered by all who delighted him. And when the Cavendish laboratories, again, you may know this story, but when the Cavendish laboratories were moved uh, to their uh, newer venue back in the early 70s, um, a young PhD student by the name of Andrew Briggs asked if they could put the words of that psalm over the door of the new laboratories. And much to his delight and surprise, uh, that occurred. And they're there now in English um, over the uh, door of the new Cavendish laboratories. I, I love that picture because that reminds me of my own days when scientists used to wear sports jackets. Um, Andrew, Andrew Briggs is uh, married to Diana Briggs, um, who is the secretary of Christians in Science. And he himself is a professor of nanoscience at Oxford University. So one of the other things that was very important for me and, and comes out of what I said already is the realization that there is no way uh, that scripture supports a God of the gaps, which is what I think some people still think today. And I was influenced by Charles Coulson, who was the Oxford professor of mathematics, who put it this way, there is no God of the gaps to take over at those strategic places where science fails. And the reason is the gaps of this sort have the unpreventable habit of shrinking. So God of the gaps was not the way to look at science. I realized that. And of course, the reason is very simple that as a scientist, I see myself understanding how God works in the world, which I investigate by experimentation. Whereas I see my faith, religion, if you like, as looking at the ultimate questions of why of purpose, of meaning. And so science and faith are providing complementary rather than contradictory explanations of reality. And that's very much at the heart of what I see as the relationship between science and faith. Now, when I'm giving this talk, uh, particularly to younger audiences, um, I like to show this picture of Harry Potter having his first kiss. And of course, a kiss, the technical name for a kiss is osculation. And scientifically, it's the pressing together of two pairs of lips with the mutual exchange of saliva and bacteria, or bodily fluids, if you like, uh, which is, of course, an accurate scientific description of a kiss, but it doesn't bring to light the full significance and meaning of a kiss, because there's the whole emotional side, what you're expressing with that kiss. And the two are complementary. Uh, you'll, I'm sure, know the other analogy, which I often use and others use, which is the one of the kettle. Why is the kettle boiling? Because water is brought to 100 degrees centigrade, at which point the molecules of water have sufficient energy or mass to leave the liquid phase and enter the gas phase. Fair enough, that's the scientific explanation. But of course, why is the kettle boiling? I want a cup of tea. So my whole sort of underlying principle is that God is the ultimate cause of all that happens, but he works through processes that I as a scientist can understand. And I love the expression, I'm sure, I'm sure you know it. Um, Johann Kepler said of scientists thinking God's thoughts after him, just understanding uh, how God works. I think that's a lovely succinct expression of how I see my um, science as a Christian vocation. The other key thing that, that um, I'm very much, uh, that very much underlies my thinking as a scientist that, is that God is active in his universe all the time, both as the architect and the workman. So I'm a theist, I'm not a deist. I don't think he, he set the thing off and then let it run 
without any intervention. I believe that everything that happens continues to be under his um, authority. And so if you think in terms of Hebrews 1.3, he upholds the universe by the word of his power. But of course, as a scientist and a Christian, I believe that God isn't fickle. He's created an ordered universe that behaves consistently, allowing scientists to investigate it by experimentation. And indeed, all scientists, whether they have believers or not, have to accept the consistency of the scientific laws, the laws of nature. If we were to carry out our research, we couldn't do it unless those laws were consistent. And that, I believe, is part of God being active today in his universe. And I also believe, of course, that that knowledge God has allowed us to uh, understand through science and the knowledge and predictions that we uh, obtain can be used for the benefit of humanity. We act then as stewards of God's creation. And that's a key part of what I see my role as a scientist, as a Christian being about. My vocation is to use my understanding of science uh, or what science tells me for the benefit of humankind. So to sum up this part of my talk, um, I, uh, as, a, as a Christian, feel that my Christian faith provides an integrated and wonderfully satisfying worldview that not only makes sense of the scientific endeavor, but also provides a better intellectual framework for living and hope for the future. And I love this quote from C.S. Lewis um, that I got out of the uh, Alice McGrath's biography, C.S. Lewis. I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen, not only because I see it, but because by it, I see everything else. So let me go now on to my scientific career and tell you a little bit about how that's developed. Um, and I've called it from fat metabolism to diabetes, heart disease and cancer, because I've had quite a, a varied career. And like a lot of people, you never know quite where your research is going to take you. Um, you can end up um, going through some quite uh, unexpected doors into new areas. I came to Bristol to do my PhD in 1970 with uh, Dick Denton, uh, who later on got his FRS and FMED Sci. And I was looking at the regulation of fat synthesis in epididymal fat pads by insulin. Uh, the epididymal fat pads are wonderful for doing research because there are two of them. In fact, epididymus means alongside the twin, didymus as in uh, Thomas the twin. Um, didymus means the twin, and there are two fat pads alongside your two testicles. Uh, this is if you're a rat, I should say. I'm, I don't know about humans. Um, but the nice thing about having uh, two of these fat pads is that you can have a control and an experimental, and they're paired for statistics. So it's a very nice way of comparing um, a control with an insulin-treated situation. Now, as I was doing that work, I was working with Pfizer, the drug company, on an anti-obesity uh, well, it was, they had an anti-obesity anti project. I had my own little project. And I was looking at a variety of compounds and, and discovered some, some very unusual properties of a compound that ended up laying the foundations of my scientific career. And I'm going to explain in a moment that the science behind that. Um, but it went on to take me down lots of avenues. I was able to make some significant discoveries in the areas of fat metabolism and how it's controlled um, in diabetes. And uh, I was fortunate to discover how uh, the most widely prescribed anti-diabetic drug metformin works. That's actually my most highly cited paper. Uh, and then I got into uh, heart disease and, and cancer. And one of the things that I discovered very early on is that um, there's a curiosity and serendipity play a major part in science. And when you get an unexpected result, if you're curious enough, you want to know how it works, it can lead you into new and exciting uh, pastures to explore. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about that discovery um, that I made and how it then developed into my uh, my scientific career. 
And this means you have to do a bit of biochemistry here. Now, as you'll know, most cells take up glucose into uh, the cell through a specific transport mechanism. Glucose gets into the cell and it is metabolized by a process of gly called glycolysis to produce two molecules of this compound pyruvate. Now, one thing that can happen to pyruvate is it can get converted into lactic acid and lactic acid then has to come out of the cell. And what I discovered when I was working with Pfizer is an inhibitor that specifically inhibits this process. And indeed, that was the first proof that there was a specific transport mechanism to get lactic acid out. You'll all know about lactic acid, of course, because it's the thing that builds up in your muscle when you exercise and causes fatigue. Um, and that this transporter is very important to get that lactic acid out of your muscle. And we found that the more you exercise, the fitter you are, the more of that transporter you have. Um, but pyruvate often goes down another route into the mitochondria. The mitochondria are the powerhouses of the cell, and they burn that um, pyruvate to CO2 and water in the presence of oxygen and produce loads of energy. And the pyruvate has to get into the mitochondria, and that also involves a specific transport process. And it turned out that my inhibitor that I discovered at Pfizer blocks that as well. And it was the first proof that there was a specific transport mechanism for pyruvate. So I was very fortuitous, it was very fortuitous that I managed to discover those two transporters. And that really set the scene for my scientific career. Um, these transporters have many other functions as well um, and are required for making glucose in the liver, and kidney for lipid synthesis in the liver and adipose tissue for oxidizing what we call ketone bodies in the heart. They have many, many functions. So it, it provided a platform for a lot of interesting research. Now I'm gonna tell you just a little bit about two, two areas of my research. One involves how we study in the lactate transport and how that led me into can, uh, studying cancer. And the other is a role of the mitochondria in the heart. So very briefly, let's look at the lactate transport. And what we're seeing, looking at here is the way lactic acid gets in and out of the cell. And we were able to, to um, isolate the protein involved. Um, we were able to show that it's a specific um, dimer of two proteins that are involved, and this is their structure. Now, until two weeks ago, this was a model structure um, that we'd worked out by uh, homology modeling, but the, the proper structure was published two weeks ago, and it, we were very pleased to see we were pretty well correct. Um, so that's the transport mechanism. How do we study it? Well, this is a Xenopus levis frog. That's a toad, an African clawed toad. And they produce a huge number of eggs. Uh, in fact, it's the Xenopus toad that used to be used in pregnancy testing, because if you put the urine of a pregnant woman on a Xenopus, a female Xenopus toad, it ovulates. But what we do is we use those eggs, they're nice and big, and we can put the DNA, the encoding um, uh, nucleic acid, inject it into one of these cells, and that cell will then start making this transport mechanism, the protein, that it doesn't normally have. So it can start transporting lactic acid. And we put a dye inside the cell, which responds to the change in pH that occurs as the lactic acid goes in. And when we do this, on a microscope, we look at the fluorescence of that cell, and we find that when you add lactic acid, you get a lovely drop um, in the pH, that's an increase in the signal here. You take away lactic acid and the lactic acid comes out and down it goes. If you don't have this protein expressed, you don't get anything. Now, what was really interesting is that working with AstraZeneca, we have a compound which very, very powerfully blocks this transport mechanism. So we put on the inhibitor here. Now we add the lactic acid, we get nothing. And this is working down at incredibly low concentrations, and it's very, very specific for this transport protein. 
And why that is important is because lactic acid getting out of cells is very important for cancer cells. And this inhibitor will stop lactic acid getting out of cancer cells and the cancer cells then pickle themselves and they stop growing. And so this has been used in clinical trials. And I have to say it was very exciting initially. It, it stopped tumor cells growing. However, on its own, it will only slow down the tumor growth and it has to be used in combination with other drugs uh, to be fully effective. But um, we found that very exciting. The other area of my research has to be looking at the role of mitochondria in the heart and particularly what happens in a heart attack. Now in a heart attack, you get um, a clot forming in one of these coronary arteries. The coronary arteries are what supplies the heart itself with oxygen and fuel to drive the heartbeat. And if you get a blockage like a blood clot here, a coronary thrombosis, then what happens is all the area downstream is deprived of oxygen and uh, glucose and fatty acids and all the things that's required to produce the energy to allow the heart to beat. So that causes your heart attack. And when you get a heart attack, you get extreme pain and your heart starts behaving very strangely. You may go unconscious and you get rushed into hospital. And when you get into hospital, what they will do is they will put a catheter up probably from your leg, groin or your arm through an artery and it ends up going in through the aorta here into the coronary artery and displaces the um, clot allowing the flow to be restored. And if you can do that quickly enough, you can get almost um, perfect recovery of that part of the heart and you don't get much damage. But if you don't do it quick enough, then you get a damaged area called the infarct, which is effectively dead. Now, the strange thing is that it's the, the act of putting the oxygen back or the blood supply back after a long period of time that is responsible for killing this, that part of the heart. And we wanted to understand how. Well, you can see the kit that I use. Well, what that first top left slide should have shown is the heart being put on that um, cannula, uh, which is the thing in the top left. And then it will actually continue beating outside of the rat. And in beating, um, it's, it's staying alive, that the oxygen is allowing it to stay alive. Now the bottom left picture um, is showing uh, that heart on the cannula with a light uh, shining on it. And the whole thing is contained in the apparatus you see on the, on the picture on the right. Now the light shining on that heart is actually changing wavelength um, between six different wavelengths, 50 times a second. And that light gets into the surface of the heart and we can actually study what is going on inside the heart uh, in real time, which is really very exciting. We can take an isolated heart cell from a heart and we can look at that on a microscope. But in fact, we can even make that heart cell beat on the microscope. And we can now study the inside of the heart in a cell in much more detail under the microscope. And doing that, we can look at the um, mitochondria, which is the organ organelle that I'm really interested in. Here's a electron micrograph of mitochondria. And it's these that are really key for the damage to the heart. Normally mitochondria, as you probably know, are the powerhouses of the cell that support all its energy requiring functions. But what happens in uh, reperfusion after a period of ischemia is that it's converted into an agent of cell death and it actually starts killing the cell. And this is um, a sort of Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde transition. Normally the Dr. Jekyll is keeping the cell alive, but when you, after this reperfusion injury, it actually starts killing the cell. And what we've been able to do is to understand the molecular mechanism by which that occurs and to develop drugs and other protocols
that stop it occurring and therefore protect your heart following um, a heart attack or during heart surgery. So that's really been very exciting. So now I want the last uh, few minutes of my talk, I want to talk a bit about some of the um, challenges that I found of being a Christian and a scientist. And, and also some of the uh, key things that I believe are part of being uh, a Christian, the vocation of being a Christian and a scientist. One of the things I think that's quite challenging for any Christian in science is balancing the demands of a career in science while maintaining an active role in the church and having time for family and, and friends. It can be a real challenge. Modern research is very, very demanding, especially I think at the moment in universities with teaching and administration and all the other things. It can be really a, a great challenge. And the other thing that can be quite challenging for the Christian in science is that the scientific workplace can be quite unsympathetic to religion, if not outright hostile. And I think many, particularly young Christians uh, early in their careers can find it very tough to even admit to being a Christian in the workplace for fear of being ridiculed. It can be really quite tough. And uh, I, I think that is something that we need to recognize and, and help young Christians who are scientists in. The other side of this is that sometimes churches don't make it easy for scientists. Um, there are certain uh, churches that um, have a very literal view of scripture. And so if they have somebody coming along who is a scientist who says, well, actually, I think the evidence for evolution is very good. They can feel very uncomfortable being a Christian in that environment. And so there are Christians who feel uncomfortable in the workplace and uncomfortable in their churches. And that could be really quite a challenge. Hopefully, uh, as I have, you can find a church where that's not the case, but it, but it can be a real challenge for some young Christians. Um, what about what is distinctive about being a Christian in science and, and what opportunities does it bring to serve God? Well, I think the first thing to say is that Christians who are mainstream scientists are the ones who are best placed to challenge the pervading atheism of the scientific world. There is no doubt that scientists are having a great impact on public opinion and many of them bring to it a very atheist worldview. And I think that as Christians in the science, we have opportunities to counter that. We can point out why the improbable world we live in may actually reflect the work of a creator who reveals himself through creation. It may not just be blind chance. And what really interests me is that many of my scientific colleagues um, use the word designed when they're lecturing sometimes. They say, well, this protein is designed for that, but they don't believe that there is a designer. Now, I'm not talking about intelligent design here. I'm, I'm standing back and saying, there is something about the world that, that, that makes it look as if there's, it's not just random. In fact, one of my um, great colleagues, Dick Denton, my ex-supervisor, when we were thinking about a problem, he'd often say to me, if I were God, how would I have done it? Um, he didn't believe in God, but, but it was as if there was something behind it driving the process. And of course, many atheists believe that. Sir Fred Hoyle, the famous uh, astronomer said, a super intellect has monkeyed with the physics as well as the chemistry and biology, and there are no blind forces worth speaking about in nature. His postdoc, uh, later very famous in his own right, Paul Davis said, there is for me powerful evidence that there is something going on behind it all. It seems as though somebody has fine tuned nature's numbers to make the universe, that the impression of design is overwhelming. Elsewhere, he says, like a porridge in the tale of Goldilocks and the three bears. The universe seems to be just right for life in so many ways. These are not people with an active Christian faith saying this. And, and I think a lot of our, our Christian, our non-Christian colleagues don't actually realize that there are many scientists who even though they don't believe in God, see there's some, some order as, as if there's a designer behind it. Even um, Richard Dawkins makes these points. The ancestor's tale, he says, the fact that life evolved out of nearly nothing is a fact so staggering that I would be mad to attempt words to do it justice. And even that is not the end of the matter. Not only did evolution happen, 
it eventually led to beings capable of comprehending the process and even of the even of comprehending the process by which they comprehend it. He's saying it's amazing. He admits it's an amazing place. And it's amazing just that we who are part of it can understand and ask questions about how we came to be and how we work. And that is something that Einstein, uh, of course, put um, very succinctly. The only incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it is comprehensible. So how do I, as a, a, a Christian in the workplace, um, how do I help my colleagues to, to look at this? Why is it, I ask myself, that they're so um, opposed to a belief in a divine being? And I, I decided that it's probably a reflection of the scientific principle we all use, which is Occam's razor. Uh, Occam, uh, an English Francescan France scholastic philosopher, uh, way back in the 14th century said, it is vain to do with more what can be done with fewer. And what we tend to say is it's the simplest hypothesis that fits the facts that is the best hypothesis. So our scientific colleagues who are not Christians will say, you can't introduce God because that's making a more complex uh, explanation and is therefore contravening Occam's razor. Well, I rather like uh, Professor Keith Ward's argument here. And, and he says, well, okay, just for a moment, um, hypothesize that there is a single incomprehensible mystery. That is, God does exist. And if you hypothesize that, that, then that offers an explanation for the whole creative process that science reveals is full of improbabilities one improbability after another. So what is the simpler hypothesis applying Occam's razor? Could it be that there is a God behind it all that explains all these other improbabilities? Now, I don't say that's a proof, but I do find it quite an interesting way of, of helping my colleagues to understand why I don't think there's anything um, in opposition between science and faith. And actually, I believe that there is a lot um, that helps my science by believing in God. Then a few very quick points to finish. Christians who are mainstream scientists are best placed to help their fellow Christians to see science not as a threat or an enemy to be defeated, but a friend to be embraced as we seek to make God known in the world. I get very distressed um, when I find that churches are being very dismissive of mainstream science, and I've already mentioned evolution, um, because I fear that they are putting an unnecessary barrier in the way of people uh, who are seeking after truth, who would like to become Christians, but see this as a big barrier. And it's, I believe very much it's an unnecessary barrier and that properly understood, scripture and science are fully compatible. And I love this quote, which I came across some time ago from Augustine of Hippo. Usually even a non-Christian knows something about the earth, the heavens and the other elements of this world. And this knowledge he holds to as being certain from reason and experience. And this is the bit that I, I like since it was written uh, 1700 years ago or nearly. Now it is a disgraceful and dangerous thing for an unbeliever to hear a Christian presumably giving the meaning of Holy Scripture talking nonsense on these topics and we should take all means to prevent such an embarrassing situation in which people show up vast ignorance in a Christian and laugh it to scorn. As a Christian who is a mainstream scientist I want to be able to say to my fellow Christians you can accept mainstream science and still have a full and high view of scripture. And you don't need to put unnecessary barriers in the way of people who are seeking after faith. Then thirdly, Christians who are mainstream scientists, I believe, and I've already touched on this, they play a key role in fulfilling the biblical command, Genesis 1.28, to be good stewards of God's world, caring for it. We can use our science for the benefit of humanity might be providing better crop yields, improved medical care, 
disease prevention, energy efficient and labor saving technologies. And of course, at the moment, COVID-19 vaccines and treatments. As a scientist, we are able to use our knowledge for the benefit of humankind. And this surely for the Christian must be part of our vocation as scientists to help our fellow men and women providing um, new information to help and uh, support. And then fourthly, Christians who are mainstream scientists can play a key role in upholding Christian values in the public arena. Uh, for example, providing a Christian, uh, an informed Christian voice in committees and think tanks concerned with the direction and ethics of scientific research and providing a science and evidence-based lead on ecology and climate change in both the Christian and secular world. If we don't have Christians in the big government committees that are making big ethical decisions and policy decisions, we can hardly be surprised if we see decisions being made that go contrary to what we believe as Christians. We need to be in there and have a voice. And it's very important in the church that we uh, as scientists can help the Christians in our churches to understand the challenges that there are in the world and the role that science can have in addressing them. These are really important. And I think at the moment, one of the key things, we could talk about artificial intelligence, but I think one of the key things is CRISPR, um, which is the wonderful advance in um, genetic engineering that, that has fantastic opportunities, but also really huge and concerning ethical considerations. And it's gonna be really important that Christians are out there um, providing a Christian perspective as decisions are made. And then finally, uh, Christians can be and should be Christ's ambassadors in the scientific workplace. Paul instructs us all, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord and not for men. So for the Christian scientists, we have the opportunity to provide a role model of how to pursue science to the highest ethical standards with honesty and integrity giving due credit to others for their work and not being preoccupied with the desire to be first, not being so preoccupied to publish uh, and to publish by not giving sufficient uh, recognition to others. We shouldn't always be wanting to do things just to be recognized as the best, to receive the awards, the accolades. We should be seeking after God's truth and we should be acting in, in, uh, with integrity in doing that. And I'm sure you, we're all aware at the moment, it's a very cutthroat place in science. There is a lot of fraudulent science going on as people seek uh, to take shortcuts, maybe ignoring inconvenient data. And as a Christian, I believe we have to set the example. The way we treat the staff who work with us and for us, these are key things and as a Christian, I need to show Christ-like behavior to be his ambassador in the workplace. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Andrew, for that. Uh, certainly great to be to share your thoughts and uh, gain from such practical experience uh, across so many different areas. Uh, so I think that will be extremely relevant to many of our attendees tonight. And it's great to find out that uh, you're a fellow Devonian as well. Uh, so that's oh, right. the highlight of the highlight of the evening <laughs> for me. Um, so yeah, if I could just ask a, a first question, um, just thinking uh, what you said about uh, the state of how science and faith and the church all interact. Uh, have you seen that change at all since uh, your time at Cambridge coming up to now? Does it change for the better or for the worse? Well, I, you know, initially I thought it was a change for the better. And when I was a student, I didn't really face too many uh, situations where I felt that I was being undermined as a, a Christian and a scientist because I didn't have this view of scripture that uh, you had to take Genesis literally. I, I didn't experience that. Um, I, I'm not sure when I started experiencing it, but, I, but it, it, so, I think it has got worse actually. It's polarized. And um, I think there's been a, quite a significant influence from the States that has 
uh, causes. I think it's worse there. Um, but having said that, I think that organizations like Christians in Science are doing a grand job at trying to address that. Um, and I, I'm, I'm hoping we're beginning to see it turn back again now. But I don't know if that's been your experience. Um, yeah, I think a bit younger than you are yourself. So my experience doesn't uh, yes. quite stretch back as well. Um, but yeah, I'd say kind of when I first started uh, going to university, like the early 2000s, it was definitely a lot more negative towards science. But in the last 10 years or so, I definitely say the pendulum is starting to swing the other way. So hopeful for the future. Yeah, so I very some, much hope so. Um, we've got questions coming in uh, thick and fast here tonight. Uh, so John is asking, uh, how has your scientific vocation impacted your spirituality? Does it influence the way you pray, meditate or contemplate? One of the things I do find is that as I study uh, science, I am more and more amazed at the beauty of God's creation and its intricacy. And it, so I, I, my science is a form of worship, there's no doubt. I mean, I, I find that's something that enhances my faith um, the more I understand about the way the world works. Um, in, in terms of um, my spirituality, it, it's a double-edged sword, I think. Um, as I say, I, I, as I uh, read the Psalms and think of the wonderful world, my scientific knowledge helps. But there are issues where I have to stop and think, do I really understand how prayer works? Um, you know, this is, and so I very much believe in prayer, but I, but I have to admit that there are mysteries there that I don't understand. And so recently I've become quite excited by the whole sort of quantum world, which is not my area, because I suddenly realized that actually in science there are mysteries too. And I think that's helped me in my spiritual life to realize that um, even as a scientist, there's a lot of things that are mysterious, that are counterintuitive. Yeah. And so I think that's been a bit of um, a help to me. Um, yeah, so I don't know if that, that sort of vaguely answers the question. And, uh, a small plug, we have a talk on uh, faith and the quantum world coming up in two months time. So you Excellent. might want to tune in for that one as well. Uh, Todd is asking, can you give an example of bad morals in science today or in the science of today? Oh, yes, yes. Um, sadly, there are many and uh, fraudulent uh, papers are constantly being retracted. Uh, people uh, make up data um, which fits their hypothesis. There is image manipulation, which is now um, with sophisticated uh, Photoshop type techniques, people are taking data from one thing and splicing it into another and making a nice picture. Uh, people are not citing uh, papers that they should cite. Um, I've actually known a situation where somebody has selectively chosen data. This is from my own laboratory and I've had to have words where they have selectively chosen data to enhance their statistics. So there are many, many different ways and it, and it is increasing and it's partly increasing because the pressures on scientists are so great that people take shortcuts. And I think now if you look in almost every journal issue, you will find at the end of it retractions because somebody has picked up there's something not quite right and the authors have been asked to justify it and have been unable to and have had to withdraw the paper. Yeah, uh, I think that's the, the big one that I've seen in um, places I've worked as well. And it, it's often little changes, little selections of data, as you say, and there's not a great attempt at deception, but it's still not right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so two related questions, comments. Uh, about, uh, as Peter puts it, coming out as a Christian uh, in your in your work environment. So uh, Saz is asking about how to create a more open atmosphere um, amongst the colleagues. I, I think I actually did something for Ruth Bankovich's blog on this about coming out, because I think it is a big problem. I, I um, have had friends and uh, students of mine who have um, 
become Christians. I mean, you know, I've they've gone through sort of alpha, but they have found it almost impossible to to admit in the Christ, the scientific workplace um, because they're so concerned that it might upset their career. Um, and what I have always tried to suggest is that you, you, you start this process of what you could call coming out just by dropping in a very um, innocent comment um, that, you know, well, uh, something about, you know, I actually went to church the other day and, uh, you know, I was really quite surprised about what I heard or um, putting in something like uh, I do when I'm in a, stre a conference, I sometimes will talk to someone and something comes up and I might say, well, as a Christian, um, I have a different perspective. And one of the things that's really amazed me is how often people uh, take you up and say, that, you know, I'm really interested in that because I haven't liked to say this before, but you know, I've been asking questions myself or my daughter's been asking questions. Yeah. <laughs> um, so just a, a, a little putting something in. And of course, you've got to be sensitive. And, it, and if the barriers come up straight away or you're getting a lot of pushback, um, then you've got to, uh, I think, hold off. You, you can't force anything down people's throats. But I, I found that that's one of the tricks. Um, but the other thing I think is really important and why I think Christians and science is important is that you need other Christians who are scientists to come alongside you in doing this and support you. Um, because I, I think it is quite tough. And I have sadly have seen several people become Christians and over a period of years, their faith has, has dwindled because they haven't had that support that they need. These things are best done in community. Yeah. yeah. So but friendship, I mean, it, there's no doubt when you have uh, gained somebody's trust um, as a friend, if you show yourself to be a good scientist and a good friend, people will be much happier when you come out and say, well, actually, I um, believe this or whatever. Yeah, we've got time just to squeeze in uh, one more question, which I think is a bit of the flip side of that. Uh, so Greg is asking, and I think reading my mind as well, uh, what would you like church leaders uh, to understand in order to help their congregational members, which might include scientists themselves, uh, know how to integrate better Christian faith and science? Well, I think the first thing is they, they need to be confident themselves there's no conflict, because I think some church leaders, sadly, um, haven't really got to grips with it. And this is where the Faraday Institute of uh, uh, Church for Church Leaders, giving them a view of science, is very helpful. Um, the other thing I think is important is to, if a, a member of the leadership team knows there are um, active scientists to, to get them to talk a bit um, and, and maybe even preach. I mean, I, when I'm preaching, I, I quite often try and bring in a, a scientific analogy into my um, preaching to, to help people see that, that the two are consistent. Yeah. Um, so, I, you know, I think it's, it's if, if the church leadership um, learns to communicate well with scientists and trust them and then can bring them into the ministry of the church it can be really effective i, I would love to see um churches put on pre-evangelistic events such as um you know faith in science and and i think a lot of people actually in the societies at large will come and hear a scientist talk about his or her science from a christian perspective i mean I've done it myself and I've been amazed that the you know, large numbers will come and listen. And I think the Christian leadership needs to take that on board. I think it's about creating a, a warm environment rather than a hostile environment. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, so a huge thank you to Andrew for his talk this evening and the wisdom he has been sharing with us. Uh, there is most definitely a role, I think, for all of us in bridging the gap both ways between the church and the scientific community and organisations, as Andrew has been saying, like CIS can play a big role in that. So please uh, get stuck in if you would like to. Uh, please also check out our Eventbrite, Eventbrite pages for listings of our upcoming events, usually meeting on the first Monday of every month at seven o'clock. Uh, our next event will be on Monday, the 1st of February at 7pm. 
and we'll be joined from our good friends from the God and the Big Bang Project uh, for an evening dedicated to newer and younger speakers in the science and religion field. It's one of the, the exciting things about being a Christian and being a scientist is we're part of some real and genuine communities and part of that I think uh, is the privilege of being able to help grow and disciple and encourage uh, younger people who are maybe earlier on their journey of life and faith compared to some of us. Uh, also to highlight, we are in the midst of planning the next uh, CIS Northern Conference, uh, which will happen on May the 7th and 8th, and that will be online as well. And we'll send the details around for that. And the theme is very relevant, being digital theology and the church. So look out for information about that in the coming weeks. Uh, so that concludes our evening for today. Uh, thank you all for joining us tonight and many thanks again to Andrew for his inspiring presentation. So until next month, uh, take care and we'll see you then. Good night. Mm -hmm.